This message is a gift to you from Calvary Bible Church in Wichita, Kansas. Well, good morning. I invite you to turn with me, if you would, to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 as we continue in our study, 1 Thessalonians, talking about the characteristics that build healthy churches in total. We've gone through a lot and uh, we aren't done yet. There's a lot of good stuff to go and we only have a few fir- verses uh, till we end this, this, uh, this epistle. So uh, chapter 5. I invite you to turn there. We're going to be in verses 19 through 22 today. While you're doing that, I invite you to grab your bulletin, if you would. And I want to start this morning with a quote that I put in your bulletin that I think is worth noting before we continue. It's a quote from A.W. Tozer in The Pursuit of God, a great book. I don't know if you've read it. Hopefully some of you have. It's a great resource I've read before and has really been a great impact on me spiritually. This is what he writes. The presence and the manifestation of the presence are not the same. There can be one without the other. God is here when we are wholly unaware of it. He is manifest only when we are aware of his presence. On our part, there must be a surrender to the spirit of God for his work Uh, um, For his work, it is to show us the father and the son. If we cooperate with him in loving obedience, God will manifest himself to us. And that manifestation will be the difference between a nominal Christian life and a life radiant with the light of his face. I find this so true in the world that we live in, in that God is everywhere. And yet so many are unaware of it. Sometimes your life and my life can even act the same where God is very real, very present. Many people see that, but you and I can feel like we're floundering. We don't know where he's at. What in the world is up? God, where are you? But when we become aware of his presence, when we receive heaven's peace is what we're entitled the message today. When we receive that, um, there's a life to be had that is full of peace. Again, talking about here the last three weeks, the environment of peace that God wants to create in us. You see, remember, we talked about last week, and I'll remind you again, Second Peter 3.14. I'm reminding a lot of people of this. Every conversation I've had here lately, I keep reminding people about this. In the last days, we are to be what? Diligent to be found by him in peace. We are to be diligent to be found by him in peace. It's interesting. This is one command. I think of another command that's very similar. Jesus said, when he comes back, will I find faith on the earth? Isn't that interesting? When he comes back, will I find faith on the earth? Will there be people that actually trust me? Will there be people that actually believe me? Will I find faith on the earth? You see, so many of us are so carnally minded, so looking, stuck in this realm, this life, this thing, unaware of his presence, unaware of his peace, unaware of the good things that God wants to give us. I think that's why we're called to be diligent to be found at peace. It's why Jesus, you know, says in a warning, will I find faith? May it be so. And may it be in us that we would be people full of peace, full of faith. Trusting the one who's in control, even in these days that are just nuts or crazy, aren't they? They're just bizarre. So what should we be diligent in? Well, we talked as we close kind of the end time scenario, talking chapters four and the beginning of five. Now, Paul is giving some final exhortations to the church. We've talked about originally here three weeks ago, following authority, how that looks. And as we follow authority, we find peace in our own lives. Rejoicing last week, talking about rejoicing always and praying. If we, we, we'd learn the power of being able to rejoice at every moment, not that we have to, but the reality is we have the opportunity to at every point. Jesus didn't always rejoice. He wept at, on times at times. Paul didn't always rejoice, but he knew we all know, according to scripture, really there's value in rejoicing in all, all times. And we have the ability to in what Christ has done for us and provided us even now in the heavenlies. We have opportunity to rejoice and we have the opportunity to pray all the time because it's not just bowing our heads, closing our eyes before we eat. It's at all times and in all things. God wants all of our concerns and all of our cares to be directed at him. So we talked about those things in the last two weeks. But this week we're going to talk about some interesting things, primarily in receiving 
heaven's peace, what God has to offer you and me, as if it's not been enough to realize that he's placed divinely authority in our lives. He's given us the opportunity to rejoice in all things. He's given us the ability to pray all the time and have the line open to talk to him. We also have even more that he gives to us to give us peaceful lifestyles, lives in these days that we live in. The first thing I want you to see, let's look at verse 18. Sorry, verse 19, rather. Chapter 5, 1 Thessalonians. Do not quench the Spirit. Commentators read this in the original language as probably better said, and in your notes you can see as it's put, stop putting out the Spirit's fire. In your notes, stop putting out the Spirit's fire. This is a very stiff command to this church who Paul is, you know, very much friends with, very dear to, near to, very caring of. We've seen it throughout this this book. But he says here in a very stiff, again, straightforward command here, stop putting out the Spirit's fire. And things that he says beyond this will explain this a little bit more further. But I want to touch on this here real quick. What, what does he mean by this? What, what is Paul trying to say? Stop putting out the Spirit's fire. Stop raining on the parade. Stop, stop getting in the way of what God is doing. It's funny. I, I should probably apologize to most of you, um, probably all of you. Um, one of my girls is probably the reason for most of the rain. Um, you see, that it was a couple of weeks ago. It was the first time we had a sprinkle out of this you know, del- deluge we've had in the last few weeks. We had a sprinkle, and then we actually let the girls go out and play for the first time out in the yard since it wasn't too bad then, and it wasn't a swamp. And, uh, and they were running around, and Anna, Anna goes, or little Anna, she goes and she picks up a stick, and she all of a sudden just suddenly loved rain. She picked up a stick, started waving it in the air, and she said, rain stick, rain stick. And so this is her rain stick. Now, it's interesting, after that, we didn't know she was doing a rain dance, and that's really what it was, because every time now she picks up a stick, it just starts, just, I mean, just unleashing, letting go, crazy rain, and she gets all excited about it, and it was just, I mean, it was absolutely hilarious. Yesterday, it was, it was raining off and on, but we took a couple of beach towels and stuff to the park, because we just needed to get them out of the house, and uh, we wiped down the slides a little bit, so they could just kind of crawl around and do some of that stuff, and uh, and Anna saw this stick, and she goes, runs for it, and, and my, I was even paying attention you know obviously my my dad is there so grandpa is just totally capable hands well he goes and he gives her the stick and i'm like no and it's it's a stick that's like this big you know i mean it's literally she's carrying this big thing rain stick right no no you know oh my word um it's amazing how you know i mean a little bit of rain's nice but but man um a damper on plans you know, and just to give you a picture, what Paul is saying here is stop pouring all your crazy water on top of what I'm trying to do. And, and, and it's tough because, you know, even I just, again, thinking about all this rain and stuff like that, it's funny, you know, Anna's all excited about it, but she's like, I want to go to the park. Well, we can't go to the park because it's all rainy. And, and we can't enjoy things outside because it's all rainy. And this is true in that when you and I stop the flow of the Spirit, whether it's in our lives or the congregation or, or, or at, uh, corporately as a whole, when we stop the flow of the Spirit, we don't get to enjoy the things that God wants to produce through the Spirit. Um, it's interesting. Look in your notes. Like fruit, get this, like fruit, in the right environment, the Spirit in us will produce fruit. Okay, like fruit, like you plant it in the right area. I was talking to some of you guys. Our girls planted pumpkin seeds in October <laughs> just for fun, stick them in the ground. They figured that was enough. That all you had to do. We didn't think anything up. Now we've got pumpkin plants all over our backyard, and they're growing really well now. That's not. It, it's going to be interesting to run into a pumpkin when I go mow here in a few weeks or a few months. But anyway, but like fruit, in the right environment, fruit is going to be produced in your life and in mine. And this is the amazing thing about how God works in you and I is that as long as we're taking care of the environment, he produces the fruit. It, 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 there's nowhere in Scripture that says you produce fruit. No, it's the fruit of the Spirit. It's the work of the Spirit in you. It's the things that God does in and through you as you take care of the, the very, again, like you say, the very simple things that we were talking about last week. It, sometimes it just undermines us, it feels like. Sometimes it feels like, God, why don't you give me more to do? And all you tell me to do is just simply trust and simply pray and simply do all that easy stuff you know we want to kind of 
take over for him. And he's, no, 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 leave that stuff to me. But the reality is, is that he's the one producing fruit in us. He's the one that's giving us, again, also not just producing fruit, but empowering us with spiritual abilities. If you take a good look at 1 Corinthians 12, you can see the, the gifts of the Spirit that God gives people. And it's, again, it's not natural abilities. It's not what you and I can do by ourselves on our own power. This is something that God does supernaturally in people. It's amazing. It's what fueled the church, and it's what continually brings life to the body today. I, I don't believe that what I do here on Sunday mornings is, is of Jim. Um, if, if, yeah, I, I am just as as a, much of a mess as many of you. And, and hopefully, I imagine all of you, you're all not as good as maybe you appear. I'm, I, I struggle, and I, it is not easy, and, and to come up here is not, but you know what, by the, by the Spirit of God, I trust that everything that I do here is something that encourages and motivates and empowers you, because it's not me that's doing this. In fact, it's not me that's taking a breath right now. It's God's gift of life that He's given to you and to me. That's what the Bible says. So the reality is, is that he gives us fruit to produce. You know, we talk about in Galatians, right, chapter 5. He gives us spiritual abilities, 1 Corinthians 12. You can look at those. We can talk about those in another time. We don't have time today. But he has plans to use you in the kingdom in some way by his spiritual abilities, the ways he's gifted you. But then also he's given us the spirit to help us understand truth, John 16, 13. He says, my spirit's going to lead you into all truth. The Spirit of God is the one that convicts us of sin, helps us understand truth, understand the law, understand the Word of God. So the Spirit is one that helps us understand truth. It helps us also by giving us life. Romans 8, 11, John 6, 33, John 6, 33 Jesus says, My words are spirit and life, right? It's, it's wonderful. The Spirit is the one that actually gives life. Romans 8 says the exact same thing. The one who's giving life to your mortal body interesting you and i are getting like when even it says paul says later on that, that even when our outer man is decaying we're being renewed inwardly day by day that god's giving us life by the spirit it's a very real and powerful thing truth to us and he also the spirit connects us with god first corinthians two sixteen. the reality is is that there's there's this ability now because of the spirit of god in you we can have the mind of christ as it says there in chapter 2 verse 16 we have this amazing ability to think the thoughts that god has in your situation and in mind they accept the wisdom and understanding of what we need to do in this situation or that um, who God cares for in a, in a moment. Sometimes you'll pop somebody in your head or, or, or an idea or a thought in your life. And, in, and it's like, oh, this is God wants me to call this person or take care of, encourage that person. Do this or that thing. He gives us the mind of Christ even. That's the spirit of God at work in us. But this is the truth. And this is why Paul mentions this so stiffly to this, the, the Thessalonians. We can grieve the spirit and even quench the spirit. With our words, our actions, and our thoughts. Look at these scriptures with me if you would. I'm just going to have them up on the screen. We can look through them real quick. Ephesians 5 says, it says this. You've heard this before probably, but we'll go over it. And do not be drunk with wine in which leads is to... Uh, dissipation or leads to dissipation but be filled with the spirit speaking to one another psalms hymns and spiritual songs singing and making melody in your hearts of the lord giving thanks always for all things in god the father and in the name of the lord jesus christ submitting to one another in the fear of god don't be drunk with wine be filled with the spirit the reality is is that there is a filling that needs to take place in your life and in mine and a lot of times we tend to put lids on those cups right we the, the reality is is that in quenching the spirit now in that realm you know sometimes again it's just like we're putting the fire out with too much water you know but then there's sometimes we don't even receive the spirits refreshing the the indwelling the filling the extra the the, the realities of what the word can bring and his peace and his joy and the fruits can bring it's like we cut the water stream off like we've had six years last six years prior and we've been in drought right Um, people can experience drought in their own spiritual life by not adhering to the Spirit of God. Romans 8, 6 says, For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. So get this, guys. This is important. We can grieve and quench the Spirit not just by things we do, like getting drunk, you know, those actions, 
But we can even grieve the Spirit, shut off the blessing of the Spirit by our thoughts. Because to be carnally minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life in peace. Don't just think that if you don't go through with that thought. Oh, I'm not talking about whether it's sin or not. You know, some people are saying, you know, well, if I think it is, it's sin. Well, you know what? Yes, it can be. If you entertain that thought too long, it doesn't matter if you do it. Your mind gets focused on that thing, that discontent, that fear, that dread, that whatever, that, that action. You become obsessed with that in your thinking You're no better off thinking about it like you are than just doing it. Reality. So you've got to watch. You and I've got to watch how we shut off, tend to, can, shut off the flow of the Spirit in your life and in mine. Not just by what we do, but by how we think. Do not be deceived, Galatians 6, 7, and 8. God is not mocked for whatever a man sows, that he will reap. Whoever sows to the flesh will reap of the flesh corruption. Whoever sows to the Spirit life and peace, we know. The reality is, is that, again, our actions, how we speak, again, Ephesians 5, the, the, the great thing is, is that the counterbalance to all these things, whether it's actions, God doesn't just say, don't do this. He says, do this instead. Right? I, I love this. In, in all these prescriptions, don't, 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 don't do things of the flesh. Act in the spirit. You know, Galatians 5 says, 5 says, you know, the things of the flesh are obvious, and he lists a whole bunch of things, but... The, the things of the Spirit are, are also just as evident, right? Love, joy, peace, patience, kind of the fruits of the Spirit. These things that you can spend all your time doing. And there's no law that stops you from doing these things in the Spirit. It's a wonderful thing. But the reality is, is that I probably even think probably more so than anything, thinking of Ephesians chapter 4 especially, That our words tend to quench the spirit the most. And I think it's probably crucial that you and I learn, again, not just our actions, but what we say and the things that we think really put a damper on the Holy Spirit. I would just challenge you as we look at this truth about not putting out the Spirit's fire, that you and I would really take a good assessment of our lives and check with Scripture what areas that we might be quenching the Spirit. Oh, not that God is not around you and and blessing you and doing amazing things. He's doing that with the righteous and the unrighteous all around us. But there's a reality, a truth to Scripture, as as Tozer touched on there at the beginning, That it's real, that as you are aware of his presence, as you receive what he wants to do in your life and in mine, as our lives line up with scripture and the authority that we have in God's word, we'll see that we don't grieve the spirit, but we're filled with the spirit. We don't quench the spirit, but we get the realities, the refreshing of the Holy Spirit of God. So don't put out the spirit's fire. You know, we, I was talking to, to some, I was talking. I was talking to a bunch of people about this truth this this last week. We tend to be, and, I, and girls, uh, well, not girls only, but children, prove this the most to me, that we are very hesitant, reluctant to the things that are best for us, aren't we? And don't let don't make God have you have triplet, you know, daughters that are two to teach you that. Uh, he will. He did it to me, but he could do it to you, and he'll use whatever. But the reality is, is that every, I, I'm, I'm so convinced. Yesterday we had pizza. We had some amazing, wonderful, favorite meal, favorite meal in the house, always will be, just the way it is. But the reality, the girls love it generally. Pizza, pizza, just really pan, cheese, pizza from pizza. Eat it all the time normally, right? Well, yesterday... You know, we're, we're feeding, and Anna just, you know, I'm, I'm feeding, and she's and she's snarfing down grapes and, you know, the, the, the things that they always love. And they eat the pizza. Just eat, just eat it. It's something you like. No. Oh, it's so good. You, you, need, you need protein, you know. No. Okay. And then it came back and did it again. And it handed it to her. Okay. Uh, yes. You know, and so, so I handed it to her, and then, wow, oh, he throws it three feet behind her, and you, woo! You know, she's just like, as it's going all behind her and just laughing at me. You know the drill, right, Steve? And really, really, you know how interested I am at giving her when she's asking for fruit? And she asks for more fruit and more cookies and more of this. You know how interested I am at giving her 
Not much after that. God's a lot better of a father than I am, probably, for sure. But I wonder if we keep resisting the good things that he wants to give you and me. And just, I don't care. How, how much do we forfeit? I, that, you know, isn't that interesting? I, just, I, I sit and look at that picture, and I think of even in my own life, you know, I don't like broccoli. I don't like a lot of things. There's a lot of things that I've, I've gone to jobs and done jobs where the first month I hate it. Oh, God, get me out of here. You know, and then after that, it's like the best thing ever, right? You know, there's a lot of things that are like that in life. We tend to be very reluctant. We tend to be very resistant to the things that are best for us, aren't we? It's just the human condition. And yet with the Spirit of God, I think that's what he's saying to this church. He's saying you're resisting what God wants to do in you. Stop. Stop putting out the Spirit's fire. Now get this. This is why he's mentioning this primarily. Now listen up in your notes. Check this out. Second thing is in verse 20. Do not quench the Spirit. Verse 19. Do not despise prophecies. Or prophesying. Do not despise prophesying, as he says in verse 20. Now, let's specifically talk about why he mentions that. He had just finished talking about the end times. Now, the end times tends to bring up some interesting thoughts, ideas, and different information. And in fact, a lot of times, in you, and I know, and I think Paul even dealt with it, because we saw that just at the beginning of this chapter, there were date setters in his day. Believe it or not, the Lord didn't come back in 1987 and then whatever that book the guy wrote about the Lord coming back in 1988 and still sold near a million copies. I was surprised. I'll have to admit, I wasn't really around reading a whole lot at that time, but I heard he sold over a million copies the first time. I can't even remember the author. Some of you might know. He wrote in 1987, hundred how many of reasons why Jesus was coming back then, and then he wrote the next book, and, and that still made the New York best-selling list. I don't know how that works, but somebody's way smarter than I am or something. But, but this is the reality, is that they were having trouble with that in that church because Paul had told them here just at the beginning of this passage, you have no need that I talk to you about times. Season. You know the day of the Lord is going to come like a thief in the night. It's going to surprise everyone. That's the reality. Now, he had to counterbalance that with this church. Because in, in the midst of people that were probably making some pretty funky prophecies and saying a lot of strange things in their day, he had to stop and say, now, wait a second. Just because we don't date set and just because we don't talk, we don't despise prophecy. Don't just throw the baby out with the bathwater. Don't just say, well, as most of the church is doing nowadays, as we talked about a few weeks ago, they're all crazy. All those end timers and they talk about the end and they go nuts and all that stuff. They're crazy. That's nothing. There's nothing about it in scripture when a a, a chunk of scripture is prophecy, folks. We know that. You throw out prophecy. You don't talk about prophecy. You don't talk about the end days. You don't talk about the return of Christ. You throw out a good chunk of the reality of scripture. But you've got to be careful. So that's, exa- that's specifically what's going on with this church. I want you to catch that, okay? He, that's why he's saying don't despise prophecy or prophesying. is because there's people probably saying, well, the Lord's going to come back, you know, after lunch tomorrow, you know, so we can get a good meal in and then he's going to take, you know. I mean, who knows? They, 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 people were probably saying all these strange things and, 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 and people were despising it. There are people in the church who are like, these guys are nuts. Why are they talking about this all the time? Why is Pastor Jim talking about the rapture? And what, what is all that stuff? That's weird. It's, don't despise that. Don't despise that. Be careful with it, but don't despise it. So that's specifically what's going on in the context of this conversation, I believe. But I think there's even more that he's saying beyond this, because it probably would be like Paul, as he talks about in some of his other epistles. I want you to understand this, because there's something amazing and wonderful about prophecy. Amos 3, 7 reminds us of this, that surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secret to the, his servants, the prophets. It's interesting. We look in Scripture, the Old Testament, we see a lot of principles about the character, the realities of God. And this is one of them that I find fascinating. I find wonderful that God doesn't just want to pounce without people knowing He always, in fact, you look throughout Scripture, the reason, the plan, the whole use of prophecy throughout Scripture was generally to warn people, hey, 
I give, I'm giving you an opportunity. A lot of people look at, at prophecy and they look at, at the Word of God and they just see death. They see death. They see death. But we know the words of God from beginning to end, from Genesis to Revelation, are always life. Jesus said, my words are spirit and they're life. And we should believe that, that his word back in Genesis, even when he was telling people that he was going to destroy them, he, he, was giving them the, he was giving them the opportunity at life. Always, in all times, in all things. God hasn't changed. It's not that God was an old, mean codger in the Old Testament and all of a sudden, you know, had a kid or something and then he was all, you know, fine and dandy, you know, in the new. That's not how God operates. He doesn't change. So he's always been life-giving and he's used his prophets to warn people to give life that he wants to provide. And I don't think that this changes about our Lord. Even today. I think he's constantly giving people the opportunity as he's speaking and he's warning and he's, he's exhorting and he's encouraging people. You go study some of the stuff about 9-11. It is amazing. It's amazing. I, I, I've read stories about people that have had dreams. Actually, there's one, one story, um, I, and I can't word, uh, you know, like names uh, fail me. I can't remember it. But you can go search some of these stories out. There was a, a, a woman that, and, not, and this didn't happen for everybody. Understand this. There's a woman that had had a dream about something horrible happening to her son in the middle of the night, day before September, September 10th, or over, overnight. She called her son that morning and had checked to see if he was going into work to do that day. And actually, he was not going to work. He had some sick, some sickness or something, or he had. He, I think he had his kid or child was sick or something. They weren't. He wasn't going to be able to go into work that morning. He said, "She said, well, that's. I just that that, that, that blesses my heart because I just I'm so concerned for you, and I don't know why. And it's just constant. And then it happened, and he would have been on one of the floors, I guess, that the plane had hit. Like, and, and what in the world, Lord? I mean, and, and she just, uh, I mean, uh, Lord, thank you for speaking to me. My goodness, you know, I, who knows? I, I had the opportunity there. If that didn't all happen, that I could have interjected what God wanted to do in that person's life. Again, that doesn't happen for everybody. But the reality is I don't believe that uh, God, if God says man can't live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds from the mouth of God, if he said that, and that's to the person living in the Old Testament and to the person living constantly nowadays in the New Testament and whatever and beyond, then God doesn't change. You and I need to hear the word of God. And that's what prophecy is about. Because, and get this, this is what I want you to know. What is prophecy? Okay, the Greek word is prophetia, and it's in the Vines Dictionary mentioned this way. A discourse emanating from the divine inspiration and declaring the purposes of God, whether by reproving and admonishing the wicked or comforting the afflicted or revealing things hidden, especially foretelling future events. It's not only future events, though, folks. Sometimes we get hung up on that, and that's all we think that prophecy is, is that unless I go to some palm reader or whatever, then that's prophecy. I mean, that's the realm of prophecy. No, no, that's not it. Because prophecy literally stated, probably in its best sense in Scripture, is at its basic form, the Word of God. And that's the definition you and I need to understand. Prophecy is the Word of God. Of God. Second Peter 1 talks about it this way. And so we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until that day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation, for prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. And what he's saying here simply is that what they had up to that point, which was the Old Testament and the Law and the Prophets, right, in the Torah, and, and, and wisdom literature, God moved on those people to write that. And that was actually the Word of God, the inspired Word of God. And then they didn't have the New Testament like we do up to that point. But they, they believed that the, the things that they were writing to the people that they were speaking to were literally divinely inspired by, the word, by, by God himself. And then you and I have a, a book that's been canonized, which the amazing thing about that is, is that God entrusted men in the 300s to look at Scripture and look at the totality of Scripture. Even before that, the great thing is, is most of Scripture, other than some of the, apoc- or the apocalyptic literature, like, like we see in kind of the first, second, and third John in Re- Revelation, 
first century, second century, third century, they were already adhering to the letters of Paul's writings and the Gospels that we have. They were already reading it as though this book was already put together. And and really the councils that put together the full canonized final version of the Holy Scriptures in the 300s, all they did was simply add Revelation in 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John because they decided that that was definitely correlative to everything else. Interesting. The great thing is, is that we have the inspired word of God here. It's it's, it's beautiful. And and it is the word of God. It's literally what he wants to to speak to you and to me, found here. Okay? Now let's get this, because understand, we need to move on even from that. I want you to see this. Prophecy is not just predicting future. It is used in Scripture to speak exhortation, edification, and comfort to men, as 1 Corinthians 14.3 puts it. It is specifically a gift given to some in the church, as Romans 12.6 talks about, but generically encouraged of all believers. Go to 1 Corinthians 14. Check this out. This is why this is important to you and should be important to you. Read this. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 5. Now, of course... Corinthian church was having a huge issue with tongues and it was being totally used out of context even in that day for sure. But this is what he says in verse 5. I wish that you all spoke with tongues, but even more that you prophesied, for he who prophesies is greater than he who speaks with tongues unless he interprets that the church may receive edification. And as he said just back there in verse 3, he who prophesies speaks edification, exhortation, and comfort to men. The person that speaks prophecy, literally the word of God, has the opportunity to speak exhortation, edification, and comfort to men. Of all of the gifts, other than again love, he ends up in 1 Corinthians 13, Paul is saying, I wish that you all would do this because it encourages people so much. You know the word of God is encouraging. Even discipline as... Hebrews 12 puts it, is supposed to be a very good thing. And even when you bring a disciplining word to somebody, it can be a very wonderful thing. Because it just shows God's looking out for you, He cares for you. He's talking to you still. He's not a father that's distant, but He's very near. So I think it's important that we realize the call, the challenge, verse 5 there, that you and I, again, this is kind of, we get kind of hung up on the people that are supposed to do some of these things, and we don't really correlate it to ourselves but the reality is is that you're all supposed to be ministers of the gospel the reality is is that you're all supposed to be ambassadors for the faith not just the pastor the real the reality is is that you all are supposed to be sharing the word of god with the ability again of prophesying which is simply sharing the word of god with other people to encourage to edify to comfort to exhort those things We have that opportunity. Now, how do we know when something, because I, because I'm like you and you, we all been there. You probably had somebody on the street say, thus saith the Lord, you know, unless you give me your blank check, I will not enter the kingdom of God or what? I don't know. You know, we've seen that. We've seen it misused and abused and it was being abused in that church. And that's why Paul was saying, you know, hey, I don't need to, we don't need to get talk about specifics. We don't need to, we don't even need to give time of day to those people. But you need to do this one thing. Don't despise it. But you need to do this. Look what he says in First Thessalonians chapter 5. Because he gives a good basic thing that you and I need to do. Verse 21, chapter 5. Well, again, let's look, let's look at it 19 through 21. Don't quench the spirit. Don't despise prophecies. Test all things and hold fast to what is good test it don't despise it just test it don't throw that pizza on the ground just take a bite you might like it oh that's oh if i could just get that half the time that's what it is we tried to feed him oatmeal last week and and they just look at it yeah oatmeal is not the most becoming looking food right oh but dad makes it good and I just, there's sometimes I just, in fact, there was one time, Julie, Julie, just hold her down. I'm going to open her mouth. We're going to get a bite in there. And it worked and they all love it now. It's great. They love oatmeal. And Annie asks for oatmeal all the time. And it's just weird now because I don't know who likes oatmeal every morning, but some people do. And our girl does one of them. 
But the reality is, oh, don't quench the spirits. Don't st- stop putting out the spirit's fire. Don't despise the word of God being spoken. Don't throw away the peace that God, the ways that God wants to work in your life. Don't just turn it off. Test it. Test it. Okay? That's the next thing I want you to see in your notes. Test it. How, how do we test it? I want to give you just a few basic things as we close here. Test it. Does it line up with Scripture? Again, if prophecy is about the Word of God... And from the beginning of time till now, the word of God has not changed. People have trusted on it, relied on it, depended on it. Then what somebody comes to speak to you. Oh, yeah, it doesn't have to be verbatim. I'm not worried about if somebody speaks to you in old King James or New Living Translation or whatever. Thus saith the Lord this, that, whatever. I don't. Peanuts. That's silly things. Don't worry about that. Test it with the word of God. Because this is what has not failed and will never fail. As Jesus said, the heaven and earth will pass, but my words will not. This is for your benefit. benefit. Because you and I can test whatever we hear, the things that other people say to us, the, the realities, the prophecies that you and I might hear from people on television, however that looks, we have the ability to test it lining up with Scripture. So that's the first test. Does it line up with Scripture? The second test I want you to think about is does it produce life? Right? John 6.33, I just said Jesus earlier on. Jesus said, my words are spirit and life. You'll know Jesus' words to you, whether this is the word of God or not to you, if it produces life in you. If it produces death, if it produces fear, if it produces dread, if it produces condemnation, if it produces any of these things that don't lead to life, I wouldn't have any time with it because it's probably not from God. It's not a word from God. So does it produce life? That's important to note. The word of God is powerful and living and active, right? Sharper than any double-edged sword. That doesn't mean that, that if it produces life, that it's always going to produce joy. And hap- You know, I mean, sometimes our reaction is not going to be joyous to hearing God's word. It's not going to be that easy. It's simple to swallow sometimes. But it will produce life. When we come to, we realize that's what I needed to hear. Man, that's a tough word, but that's, yeah. I've had a lot of that. I've, I don't know about you. Maybe, maybe God sent somebody in a prophetic way to you, speaking God's very word to you in an exhortive way. And sometimes you just got to take a breath and like, whoa, that's tough. But it produced life. It was what I needed to hear. It lined up with Scripture. It produced life in me. And this is important to also note as well. Is God confirming that word to you? So I've had a lot of people, I've even been on some bunny trails in the past where people have said things to me, given me a prophetic word, quote unquote, and I've gone down that way and checked out that thing or whatever. And I saw dead ends. I saw stop signs. I was not good. Turn around. Don't drown kind of stuff. And the only way I knew that was as I was keeping in touch with God, God was saying, "Uh uh-uh, no, 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 I'm not confirming that to you. That's not of me. And this is so important and it's so key. I, I, I mentioned Judges 6 because that's the fleece principle. You remember, Gideon was like you and me. There's times when we hear things and we're just like, I don't know if this is you, God, or not. I'm flesh. You're spiritual. I'm human. You're not. How do we bridge this gap? I want to know if it's you, God. I don't know. Is this your will? Is it not? And Gideon, in just that moment, just remember, you, you know the story. He set out the fleece. You know, Lord, make the fleece wet and the ground dry. And then, and then that wasn't enough. So just reverse it, Lord. Would you do it the next day? Would you do it that way? And then I'll know that whether this is you or not. There's a lot of people that say, well, that, that lacks faith. God will never work in that realm. He'll never work by confirming his word to you. Don't use the fleece principle is what sometimes we like to say or we call it. That's, that's untrust. That's putting God to the test. If you put God to the test, you're going to hell. You know, I mean, people are like, oh, baloney. Look at Romans 12. Does anybody have, go look at, turn in your Bibles to Romans 12. I love reminding people of this. Romans 12. We know these two verses very well, but look at verse 2 of Romans 12. 
And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing. And that's a continual renewing daily. Renewing of your minds that you may, what? Prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Why would God ask you to prove his will if he didn't want you to check it out, test it out, seek it out? God wants you to know his will. Isn't that great to know? God wants you to know his will. And he's given you every opportunity by the Spirit, through the Word of God, however he may organize your situation, whether it's through a word from somebody given, that God empowers or inspires somebody by the Word to give you, whether it's how your circumstances work out, however he may confirm that to you, God wants you to know his will for your life. Isn't that great to know? He wants you to prove it. He wants you to test it. He wants you to find his will for your life. And the great thing is, is he helps. He wants to confirm that to you and to me. So whenever you and I come into some of these situations where we're trying to figure out, God, what is your word? What does is, what is all of that look like? Is God confirming that to you? Are you proving that? Are you testing it? And as you're testing it, it's coming true or it's not? That's important. You and I would learn. We wouldn't just take things and run with them and, and just believe them face to face. Test them. Be like a Berean. In fact, that's what happened in Acts, wasn't it? Right after Paul left Thessalonica. We've been in Acts. We just finished Acts at our senior center study. As he left Thessalonica, what happened? He went to Berea. What did he note about the Bereans? They were more noble than the Thessalonians. They were more noble at them because they tested or they searched the word of God to see if these things were so. The Thessalonians were like, oh, believe whatever you tell us, Paul. And he, he admired them for that to some degree. But in noted in, in, in Acts, Paul said, the Bereans were more noble than the Thessalonians because, you know what, they didn't just take the word that I said. They tested it to see whether it was so. They wanted to really experience. They, they really realized that if you seek the Lord, if you really seek him out, you test it, you check it out, you seek him, you're going to find him. And boy, in the world that you and I live in today, because hear me out, In the world you and I live in today, in these last days, get this folks, Joel 2, Acts 2 promises that God's spirit would be poured out. And men and women are going to have dreams and visions and prophecies and things of that nature. That's the reality that God wants to give in the last days so that you and I can have peace or understand what he's doing. Because he doesn't do something without warning people. That's a great promise. But I think you and I live in a day, and I get that, I understand this. I talked to somebody yesterday. Hear me out, please. In this last moment, we, I talked to a couple of people in the last few days, actually, that it was, did you hear what this person said about Jade Helm 15? Did you hear about the prophecy about Obama? Did you hear about the cloning of Prince William? And we laugh, and, and it was hard for me not to in that moment, but I knew the scripture Don't despise. So I listened. But I tell you one thing. Is that in the days we live in, because I believe the word of God has more amplification, has more application, is being seen in prophecy. In the days we live in, the reality Satan is also working all the more to take you and I and squander or squelch our peace, to quench what the Spirit wants to do in us. So you've got to be very careful. And I just listened to these people and I just said, okay. But I reminded them, and I tried to remind them as best as I could in the most respectful way that I could, is that, you know what, I've got the Word of God telling me that He's in control. And you know what, the big one underneath the Grand, or not the Grand Canyon, but underneath Yellowstone, whatever, that if it happened, it would wipe out the United States. And that's why my, America is not in prophecy and this, that, and the other thing. And you hear these people and they say, oh my goodness, why don't I just go bury my head in the sand, you know, kind of thing. When I hear that, I know that God is keeping things in his perfect will. I don't see anything about Jade Helm 15 in Scripture. I don't see anything about Obama in Scripture. 
I do understand that God's abandonment wrath can be the worst thing of all, and that he will abandon a nation. I mean, there are prophecies you and I could, we could stand here, we could prophesy all day, just out of the word of God, this is what's going to happen to this country. And we would be right in saying it. Are we on the verge of financial collapse? You betcha. I could prophesy that right now. You know why? Because nobody in trillions and trillions of dollars in debt ever gets anywhere for long. I think you and I could prophesy about a lot of the lifestyles and the things that this world is coming to, this nation is coming to, because we're, we're allowing these things in our society. Sure, I think you and I could all day long prophesy judgment and things on this nation. But it wouldn't do a whole lot of good unless it gave life, because that's what prophecy is about, giving life, giving peace. Not saying peace, peace when there is none. Don't get me wrong. But understanding that we know better. So don't get caught up in these things that take or steal your peace. Test things with scripture, folks. Don't know the conspiracy theory or the latest sight. Know Christ. Know the word. Understand that he wants to speak to you as often as you eat. Because if it's about more important than bread that he would speak to you, if, my word, if his word is something that we need to live on more than bread is what I'm saying, then he wants to talk to you. And he has plans for you. And he has truth that he wants to share. And peace that he wants to give. And life by the Spirit he wants to... In the last days, that's the thing, talking to these people and giving them in times truth. Paul is saying, oh, don't put out the Spirit's fire. Don't. Stop what God wants to do. And in all of these conversations that I've had with some of these people, it's been death, destruction, and despair, and hell. Literally, hell. Let's give life. Let's be people of peace. Let's understand that you and I have the opportunity to counterbalance all the prophecy and all the junk in this world where people are speaking just judgment. and We have the ability to speak the wonderful things of God in a prophetic way because it's the Word of God. And we can share that. And we can be diligent to be found at peace when He returns. Okay? Let's pray. Lord, thank You for this time. Lord, I pray that You would fill everyone in this room overflowing with Your Spirit. Would they experience the really true in feeling oh lord not that they don't have the spirit lord everyone here has we know when we're saved we're sealed by the spirit of god and he comes to live inside of us we know these spiritual truths yet lord we leak as it's been said well and we often aren't filled and the command is to be filled and that's not always easy but lord as we come as we recognize as we anticipate your work in our lives lord not putting our mind on the flesh and the things of this world and the cares and concerns of this life because that leads to death but as we put our mind on you and the things that you want to do on every day and every moment in our lives by your spirit as we stick our mind and focus it on you in your word, we, we, we get a feeling that only comes by your spirit. And Lord, would we not put out the fire of the spirit? God, would we be people that, that don't despise when people try to speak for you, but Lord, that we would be careful handlers of your word, that we would test things, that we would receive what is good and hate that which is evil. And put it away from us. Lord, would we be people receiving your peace in these last days? We wouldn't be a church simply grabbing guns and going for the coasts. But God, we'd just be people that would be at peace, trusting you, depending on you, giving life through you to the world. Thank you. Thank you for the peace that you give by your spirit. May we receive it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Receive it in Jesus' name. Amen.